while the last minute's here while everybody's getting in, uh, I've been asked to say that lunch today will be over in the chaos and KME rooms. So um, everybody head off after the end of the caucus session, please, and go to the chaos and KME rooms for lunch. So the first session this morning is a tribute to Ken Johnson. Um, and I think all of us who've been involved in this field will have been influenced in some way by Ken Johnson. You may not have read his uh, book on contact mechanics, but it's the foundation of a great deal of what we do. Um, so I feel a little bit honored to have uh, been asked by Z Lee to give an appreciation of Ken for this uh, conference. Uh, and my tribute's illustrated a little by uh, some of the photographs I have of Ken. And when I was putting this together, I went through my photographs uh, and found that I don't think I have a single one of myself alone with him. Uh, that seems a little surprising, perhaps, in a world where we have selfies and take photographs of pretty well everything and anything. Um, but although I knew the guy for 40 years, uh, I have very few photographs of him. Um, so, Ken was a person who had won great loyalty and affection from his colleagues and friends. But he demanded neither of these, and nor did he expect it. Uh, he'd rarely argue, but he would relish discussion and disagreement, uh, and the genuine difference of opinion. Uh, and I think for him, disagreement and discussion uh, that arose from it were the fertile soil from which new ideas sprung. And I think it's worth remembering that. It's possible to disagree on things and discuss them. Uh, and if we agreed on everything, then it's extremely unlikely that we'd come up with any new ideas. And one of his great characteristics, too, was he was an amusing person with uh, an irreverent and dry and very self-deprecating sense of humor. That means he could laugh very easily at himself. In this, it's, it's true to say he was fairly British to the core, uh, but he was also an ardent internationalist. And he would, for example, have loathed the isolationism of Brexit. He was not self-important, and he was unpretentious and without uh, what you'd call an English humbug. And I'll tell a few stories that illustrate this, these qualities. First of these is that, uh, well, should, this is one of the few pictures I have of Ken on his 80th birthday party. Uh, this actually is not part of the story, but uh, forget which order I have these in. So this was a party with people with whom he had written papers at one point in his life. Uh, some of them former research students, um, kind of going back over several decades. This was in 2005 in Cambridge. So the first story I have of Ken was I was commuting to London in the 1990s, uh, and I was coming back late one afternoon on the station platform, and he was there on the station platform looking slightly kind of uh, hangdog, depressed, and a bit run down which he sometimes did when he was expected to do something that he wasn't looking forward to. And I asked where he was going, and he said, I'm off to the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. They're awarding the Tribology Gold Medal to one of my research students. And I don't know why I recommend these people. Then the Institution of Mechanical Engineers gives them medals, and I don't understand why. And then I go, to the present, then I have to go to the presentations. So, uh, and if he didn't understand that, I'm not entirely sure why 
Uh, anyway, in 1982, for Contact Mechanics Conference, we were staying in the student halls of residence at the University of British Columbia. We'd just arrived, and I'd discovered my clothes were creased from being in my rucksack all the way from the UK to Vancouver. So I went down to the reception desk and borrowed an iron. Uh, on my way back, a fellow research student who was working then with Professor Krause in Hanover saw me and asked, where did you get the iron? Uh, so I said, well, down at the reception desk. Ah, I shall have to iron Professor Krause's trousers, uh, he said. So I told Ken this story later, and he smiled and said, I can't imagine you ever ironing my trousers. So the research student became a professor, and Ken later, when he met him at tribology conferences, would tickle him about this story for the next few decades. So in the 1980s and 1990s, Professor Kunota, whom many of you will know, ran a large research group working on rail corrugation at TU Berlin. And Klaus's approach to research differed from Ken's, like chalk and cheese. Nevertheless, they were very good friends and colleagues. And the academic world in which Klaus was a master, with European research grants and a steady flow of government-funded projects, a steady flow of research projects, and sustained by a stream of research students coming in and jobs in the railway industry going out, it was not a world in which he functioned, nor is it really one that he would have enjoyed. He told me once that Klaus had gone to Brussels to defend TU Berlin's portion of funding in a proposed EU corrugation uh, project on corrugation. After a while, Klaus, the ever the entrepreneur stated, and if you give us the money, you'll get Professor Johnson for nothing. <laughs> and that was probably the truth. So one of Ken's greatest qualities as an engineer was to take a problem that everyone thought was difficult and make it wonderfully easy. And this is probably the most important single thing that I myself learned at Cambridge. When you first read Ken's papers, it's tempting to think, I could have done that, but of course, very few you couldn't, and very few people could. And that's probably why he made so many significant contributions in so many areas. He had a searing intellect, and that cut through rubbish and obscurity, and reduced a problem to its core. Simplicity and clarity were also of paramount importance in writing papers. These should be as clear as possible, with no long sentences written in simple language. I recently read some advice that one of the most senior journalists in the UK had been given when he was a junior reporter, but it's equally well something that Ken could have written and uh, said to his students about technical papers. This was, if you write for dukes, only dukes will understand. If you write for the man who collects the rubbish, both will understand. And keep it short, keep it simple, and write in a language that you would use if you were talking to your mum or dad. So making the world, making the complications of the world into something that anyone can understand is a great quality of an academic and teacher. But Ken told me he never did very well in consultancy work. After working as a consultant myself, I realized that this is because some clients look at what has been explained simply, elegantly, and concisely, and then they wonder why they should, be, why they should pay to be told the obvious. Ken worked closely with British Rail Research for most of its existence, and there he found people who were unassuming experts whose motivation, like his, was to understand the world. He and they were unpretentious in a very British way. Alan Wickens, who was one of the many at British Rail Research with whom we worked, has commented that one of the great qualities of Ken's work was that every calculation had to have measurements to back it up. 
Ken published nothing unless measurement and calculation complemented and supported one another. This was an excellent discipline for research students, but it could be very uncomfortable for those of us whose work was on the railway. But this rigorous approach has undoubtedly helped to make Ken's research uniquely valuable. It was also not work that he deputed to others, even when he was a professor in Cambridge. If there was a field trip to examine corrugation, somehow this would be to the Scottish borders or to the Lake District. Ken would come, we'd add on a day of walking, and we would all enjoy it. <clears throat> and to illustrate this, it's, well, there's a photograph of Ken and Dorothy Johnson, Paul Clayton, who's written lots of papers in contact mechanics, metallurgy, and um, uh, this photograph from contact mechanics in 1990. And I think one of the things to illustrate Ken's unassuming nature is that although he was chairman of this conference, you'd have a hard job spotting him in this crowd here. He's about halfway back on the right-hand side. Uh, and those of us who are stealing the glory are all at the front. <clears throat> um, and this is a little, the little collage of photographs of what I have showing um, Ken where he was most at home, which was the top couple here are at uh, Condalilla Falls in Queensland. Uh, he and my parents are there, and Dorothy, Ken and Dorothy Johnson, my parents knew each other well, got on with each other, and this was a walking trip they went on up in Queensland. And down in the bottom here is a uh, photograph taken after Contact Mechanics Conference when we went walking in the provincial parks in British Columbia. So these were the kinds of things that he, in which he took great pleasure. So go back one. There we go. So this was uh, where he would feel happiest. Anyway, so Ken carried his uncompromising attitude through most of what he did. In my own doctoral research, I developed models of railway track based on an Euler Bernoulli beams. Our calculations correlated well with the measurements from British Rail's test track. And in a parallel project, Rob Clark and colleagues at British Rail Research uh, demonstrated that shear flexibility and rotatory inertia were significant in the rail's high frequency dynamic behavior. We'd already completed our papers for publication, and uh, we'd read them through to each other, and they were ready to be submitted for publication. But Ken said, no, you'll have to use a Timoshenko beam for these models. Really? Why? Surely we can write another paper or another series of papers. But no, if we know that Timoshenko beam is a better model than an Euler Bernoulli beam, we're not going to publish papers using an inferior model. And so I have to go back and rewrite all the papers, do all the work again, and publish just one series of papers. But in the end, I think it's worth realizing it's better to publish one series of good papers than several series of bad papers, or half good papers. Ironically, the final joke in this little saga was on Ken himself. The co-authors of these papers were my primary supervisor, Wiley Gregory, who's in this paper here slightly down the hill, a former PhD student, Dave Harrison, Ken, and myself. Ken Wiley and I were in the tea room discussing the final details of the revised papers. And Ken asked, in what, author, in what order will we put the authors? We looked at each other, and Wiley said, well, why not just put them in alphabetical order? I don't do very well out of that, do I, said Ken. So the papers appeared, and the, order, and the authors in order are Grassy, Gregory, Harrison, and Johnson. 
So Ken did not give praise easily, and his criteria were not ones that the outside world would generally have shared or understood. As I said, Ken and Dorothy knew my parents pretty well. They stayed with one another, went walking together, and had good times together. So Ken was well aware how important it had been to my mother in particular that I'd studied in Cambridge. Nevertheless, on one of their shared times together, he'd said to her, Stuart is not the best research student that I've had. He probably intended that as a compliment, but uh, my mother was a bit surprised. So the story on which I'll end this is from 1982. I was a research fellow in Cambridge. I'd six years into my research there, finished my PhD and work in postdoctoral work. Every three months, we used to go to the West Coast Main Line on British Rail to do field work. And a colleague used to remark that this was an excellent method of long-range weather forecasting. When we made a field trip, it would rain. This was not today's world of Gore-Tex jackets, waterproof trousers, warm gloves, and waterproof boots. We would spend the day on a windswept railway embankment with the rain lashing down. Trains would pass at speed without chemical retention toilets. So if you saw a cloud coming towards you, someone had just flushed the loop. So you turned to avoid the spray of raw sewage. Few people would choose to come on such a field trip. But Ken used to come for many years, and then he left it to me for a while. But one day, he said, can I come on your next field trip? Well, I was delighted. A day with Ken was always a pleasure and never wasted. So we parked his Ford Cortina, joined the safety crew, climbed up the railway embankment, and did the morning's measurements. As expected, it was raining. There was a howling wind, it was cold, it was miserable. At lunch, we climbed into the front seats of his Ford Cortina. He dug out his sandwiches and his thermos flask of tea. Condensation streamed down the windscreen and the rain lashed down outside. And we sat inside in our soaking clothes. He munched his first sandwich and got out the newspaper. The Times? Ken didn't read the Times. He read The Guardian, which was a paper for people who had fairly liberal opinions. And then he opened the page, he opened the newspaper at the court and social pages. The court and social pages, amongst other things, tell you what the Queen and the royal family are doing today. So he flapped this at me, and I was a bit speechless. Um, what had happened to this man that I knew well, reading the Times, interested in the Queen's movements? So he pointed to the bottom of the page. Elections to the Royal Society, K.L. Johnson. I lunged across the car and gave him a huge hug. He was beaming from cheek to cheek, but he was also looking a little bemused, almost embarrassed, as if to say, why me? I managed to ask, why are you here? Any normal person would be at home lapping up the glory. Everyone will be phoning. I don't want to spend the day answering the phone. So that, my friends, is the Ken Johnson that I knew. He preferred to be seeing railways at first hand from a wet, cold, windy railway embankment than answering the phone and lapping up the glory of being one of the few engineers who had then been elected a fellow of the Royal Society. Thanks very much.